Well, welcome back, everyone. This is part two of a three-part series on, we, on women in the New Testament. And again, we have uh, Father Stephen Morris with us. We thank you for coming back. We look forward to it and hand it over to you whenever you want to start your screen share. All righty. So uh, to begin, I thought uh, we would start with a, a call it. Um, we're going to start by talking about um, Saint Fotini, the woman, the Samaritan woman that Christ met at the well, the woman at the well. And in some of the more recent supplemental liturgical material available from the Episcopal Church, Saint Fotini is commemorated on February 26th, which is a slightly different date from the days from when she's commemorated in other churches. But it's an, it's during Lent, so you have to take the space when you, when you uh, can find it. And so, and this is the call up that is provided. O God Almighty, whose most blessed Son revealed to Fotini, the Samaritan woman, that he is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world, grant us to drink of the well that springs up to everlasting life, that we may worship you in spirit and in truth, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. So, if I can just be really fancy here. So just for a couple minutes, I wanted to show, here's a, a, a modern icon of St. Mary Magdalene we were talking last week of, with her red egg. She's portrayed slightly uh, like a Middle Eastern woman uh, and she has the red egg that she showed to, to uh, the emperor Tiberius and she has her loose hair and, and red cloak, but then Saint Fotini, the woman at the Samaritan well, here we, uh, she is shown with her, her jar of water talking to Christ. And the, the well is this cross-shaped um, well in the, in, the, in the earth there. Since they're talking about the water of life and the living water, which has always been understood to be a reference to baptism, the well itself is depicted as a font that very often in, uh, in ancient churches, we find that the font is, is a cross-shaped stone monument sunk down into the, into the ground. And the, 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 the phrase living water is an idiom for running water. And so the, the, there's very sophisticated plumbing in these baptistries so that the water runs into the font and then runs out again so that the person is baptized in living water. And you have to step up uh, here and then there's also steps down into the water um, uh, inside and the women would be baptized uh, separately from the men because everyone was baptized in the nude. So the, the building in the back with the curtain is a baptistry. It's also a stand in for the city where the, the Samaritan woman lives in and the, the, the red curtain there indicates that the, the well that the baptism is it happens inside there. So I will stop the sharing. There we go. So um, for, for team, let me just move my, if I can see everybody. Um, the Samaritans were not popular people. You know, <laughs> to say there is a good Samaritan is like saying there is a good black guy in the Southern Confederacy that just is impossible. People just couldn't wrap their heads around it. And Samaria is kind of, you know, it's in the very north of first century Judea, Palestine is Galilee. Then in the middle comes Samaria, and then down below is Israel. So, so um, I mean, like in New York, you can cross the street and suddenly be in a very different neighborhood. You don't just cross the street and find yourself in Samaria. It's a hike. So you have to deliberately go there. And Christ deliberately went to Samaria at least once um, that we know about because he, he talked with several uh, Samaritans at different points in the, in the gospels. But the Samaritan woman is one of the most, um, uh, most well-known ones. So um, she is also one of the oldest images found in the Roman catacombs. Uh, that uh, she is standing by the well in, in the catacombs as an indication of baptism and therefore you know, new life that the deceased have entered into. 
it says right in the gospel of, of St. John that she was a missionary, that uh, she, you know, she went into the town and told everybody, come and see the one who told me everything I ever did. And she is remembered, and she remembered, and she is remembered primarily as a missionary. Um, the the early records say that she had five sisters and two sons, um, and she converted her family, and her sons, who became Roman army officers, uh, were also Christians, which is a very problematic uh, situation to be in because you had you had to participate in pagan sacrifices as, as an army officer. So it put them in a very difficult position. But um, the early records say that after the apostles, Peter and Paul were martyred, Fotini and her family uh, left Samaria and they traveled to Carthage, which is on the Northern coast of Africa across from Rome. And so they went to preach there. And the records say that in 66 AD, when Nero was persecuting the, the church so vociferously that they were all martyred, that she, her two sons and her five sisters were all killed by the Romans and that Fotini in particular was thrown down a dry well. And she, uh, she broke her neck and she was killed uh, by being thrown into the well. Uh, there's, a, there's a very uh, interesting article that you can read if you want at episcopalcafe.com. Uh, they there's, a, there's an article about reflections on St. Fotini, uh, which is an interesting compilation of some of the stories about her and the experience of an Episcopalian woman who, who is an iconographer and teaches iconography and um, her experience painting the icon of St. Fotini. So like I said, anytime anybody has a question or a comment, please whistle, wave your hand, uh, get my attention and, and feel free to, to ask. But I think Fotini, you know, her name means light or light giver. Uh, this, and the Russians call her Svetlana, which is the same name in, in Russian. Uh, Svet is, 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 means light the same way Fos uh, means light. So she has bec she's a very popular saint in the Eastern church in as, as a woman missionary and uh, as a way of you know, identifying people in the gospel you know, and, and, and making connections with people in the gospel and having some familiarity there. So I figured today we will uh, talk about several different women in Acts and in some of the epistles and then next week we'll circle back around to Mary and Martha and some of the other women in, in the gospel. In um, in Luke chapter, uh, yes, June. I have a question. How, how do you spell that name? Fotini? Name? Yeah. Uh, P-H-O-T-I-N-I. P-H-O-T-I-N-I. -I. Okay, and uh, well, another, I have a question. Um, I know that this is the longest uh, exchange that Jesus has with anyone in script in yes in, it's quite a long yeah and particularly with it would you make much of that or is that not significant it's uh but it is the longest single conversation and exchange in in all the gospels right um Jesus um the 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 gospel of John has chapters four six nine, 10, 11, they all tend to be rather long. And, and each, each chapter is sort of focused on a particular story that goes on for quite a while. Um, the Fotini episode, and, and each of, the, each of those um, other chapters, there's a miracle or an incident and then a sermon attached to it. In this case, there seems to be, the sermon is kind of included in the incident. So that he, the, the, the extended sermon of, that results from Fortini's um, encounter with Christ is actually part of the conversation. So it's part of this, that's, uh, and, and the apostles weren't, the, the, the male apostles were not, were not there. So the only source for this is either Jesus himself or Fortini who told the men what Christ had told her. So it, it's, it's, part of the, it's partly the way St. John 
puts the sermon together with the con in, in the context of the conversation, which makes it such an, an extended encounter. But it's probably also refle reflects some, a memory that this happened probably several times and just didn't get written down in, in each case that Jesus did give uh, private tutorials that he did preach into small groups as well as to large groups. And that um, I think it, it, it is very interesting that the, the, the one that's recorded is to such an extended conversation with not just a woman, but with a Samaritan. Yeah. Yeah, Gwendolyn. Uh, I just want to let June know that, and everyone, that the names are in the e news in okay. the, the section that describes this course. Okay. But I got my notes here and I don't have the emails. Right, for, for, for spelling purposes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank Thanks. you. You're welcome. Yeah, Mother Kathleen. I just have to chime in to say we have a Svetlana in our parish. Ah, right. right. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so we can wish her happy, happy Saints Day in February. Exactly. That's great. You know, Samaritans are really despised, despicable people. And the fact, and you know, part of Christ's conversation with with uh, Potini is that you know you've had five husbands and the man you live with now is not your husband. You know, either she had a really incredible string of bad luck that every man she married <laughs> had a heart attack, uh, or and then 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 she just gave up and and just married you know lived with this guy uh, without even going through the pretense of getting married, maybe hoping that. Uh, this, this guy would survive, um, but she um, she's not ever accused of being a prostitute. You know, Samaritans in general were just licentious, despicable people, and so of course Samaritans would have you know multiple husbands, multiple wives, and. And a lot of the early sermons about Fotini talk about the five husbands being like the five senses. And, and so that, you know, you, you're, you're, the, more you, you know, the more you give yourself over to sin, the, you kill your senses, you deaden your senses uh, as a way to survive. And we know that that's how people you know, react to addiction, say, you deaden your senses in order to survive uh, the, the inner pain. Um, so the, the early sermons about Fotini, Fotini and the, the whole episode with the, at the, the well in Samaria, Samaria are, are really sophisticated and very interesting. Um, they're well worth uh, your perusal to look up uh, like the collected sermons of St. Augustine or the collected sermons of John Chrysostom or some of the early, other uh, collections of, of fourth and fifth century sermons. Um, and, and they talk about also Christ having such an extended conversation, not only with, not only with a woman, but with a Samaritan. So that, you know, I forget who, I think it's St. Luke who has this, the parable of the good, the good Samaritan. So this is kind of John's version of that. Okay. Uh, I was going to, I uh, thought we'd, we'd, we'd um, if I can find my notes here. Um, yes, in Luke chapter, I thought we'd stop briefly in Luke chapter 8, where it says there, will, there was a woman with 12 years an issue of blood. And she, she it, Jesus is going to heal the daughter of this uh, Roman. And this woman in the crowd comes up and touches him. And she's healed. And so it, it, it interrupts the whole, uh, Jesus stops and says, who touched me in, this, in the crowd? And, the, and the, the, the men say, are you crazy? Everybody touched you. How can you, how can you tell you know, in this crowd? Everybody's crowding around. And so Jesus stops and, and talks to the woman because she finally raises her hand and says, it was me. And I'm sure the Roman, you know, uh, Jairus, was just getting... It was beside himself because the, every minute that Jesus delayed going to heal his daughter was, a, was a, made it less likely that his daughter would survive. Uh, but Jesus stopped and, and talked with this woman. And she's the one who is said to have, her name is given uh, as either Bernice in the, in the early stories. She's either Bernice or Veronica. 
those are two 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 versions of the same name uh, again you know you know like bill and charles and william are all the same name and, and different because they all mean the same thing so bernice and veronica are the same name so she is the you know credited with uh, then meeting christ again as he's carrying the cross and that she takes a cloth and wipes his face and then she takes the cloth away his the, the image of his face is imprinted on it um, we get her name veronica from that incident with the cloth on the uh, wiping jesus face because veronica is latin for true icon Ooh. And so it's, 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 that incident gives her her name, uh, basically. Otherwise we would have a way to identify her. And so that cloth is eventually uh, taken to, to Rome and it's kept in the old, in old St. Peter's. You know, the one that was put, St. Peter's that's there now was not the original one. Uh, the original St. Peter's was, uh, church uh, had a collection of relics that included this, this cloth. And some people say it was destroyed in the 1500s when Charles the, I think Charles V sacked the, the city. Um, but the Vatican is, says, you know, they, 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 have, they still have the cloth and it's the same one that it survived the sacking. But a lot of places have very similar images. And of course, the most famous of them is the Shroud of Turin, which shows not just the face of Christ, but with his whole body. And the, the shroud is said to have been a shroud from the, the tomb. So generally, um, there's also another story about a, a cloth with Jesus' face, also called the, the true icon, the true image that uh, Abgar, the king of Edessa, is said to have written a letter to Christ saying, please come heal me, I'm sick. Uh, and Jesus uh, told the messenger, I don't have time to go all the way to Edessa, which is quite, it's even, you know, if, if Samaria was a hike, Edessa was even, it was, it was way far away. It would, it would take much too long to, to get there. So Jesus took a cloth, wiped his face and gave it to the messenger and said, here, take this back to King Abgar. And when the messenger got back to Abgar, he opened the cloth and there was the image of Christ's face imprinted on the cloth. Abgar washed himself very much like Naaman the Syrian and other people in the Old Testament would wash themselves to be healed. And then Abgar wiped himself with this towel uh, and was healed partly. He, was, he wasn't quite healed all the way, but he was healed significantly. And then one of the apostles, I, um, I, think, I think it um, Barnabas, maybe, or thought Bartholomew, one, one of the B apostles, uh, came to Edessa later and, and finished the miracle of healing Abgar the rest of the way. Um, but there are a lot of these images of Christ's face in the ancient world. And, you know, they, whichever one is the original, the one to Abgar, the one at the, the tomb that, that ended up in, in Turin. Or, or whichever one came first, the others are copies of it. And there's, uh, how do I want to say this? A system for classifying these kind of relics developed so that a first class relic is the original. Then a second class relic is a copy. And a third class relic is something that's been touched to either a first or a second class relic. So that, for instance, if you go on pilgrimage to a city that has one of these images and you bring your own cloth, your own towel, and touch it to the, to the, the, the image that's in the shrine, that now you have a third class relic to take back home as a, as a holy souvenir, basically. But once you get back home, it be, everybody else, you know, it's a, it has touched a powerful talisman. And so it becomes a focus for the local people who didn't go on pilgrimage with you, but it becomes a way for them to access, you know, the, the event that's depicted on the original uh, cloth. So that these uh, tertiary, they're, they're third class, not because they're less than, but just they're, they're a third of the way removed from the original. 
but it, these third class relics are a way for people to participate at a distance in the original event because not everybody could you know it would take years to go walking across Europe to get to, to Rome or to Jerusalem or to Edessa or any of these Turin any of these places that had the the, the old images so people would bring their you know cloth to make new images and take it back home uh, and of course and then also people would sell copies in you know at kiosks around the original and then you could buy them and touch them to the original and then take that home to you for, uh, for your devotional use as well so these were all, all ways you know for people back home to access that experience uh, it's the, same, it's the same kind of way, you know, we, we have a record, a woman of, uh, from Spain named Egeria went to Jerusalem and she was there for Holy Week uh, around the year 380. And she took very detailed notes about what the services were like. And she, when she got back home, um, the, the, she was uh, a nun, an ascetic woman. And all the nuns said, oh, let's do the services just like the way we do in Jerusalem. And pretty soon everybody wanted to do this. Other pilgrims went to Jerusalem and everybody wanted to do the services in Holy Week just the way they did in Jerusalem. So it's a very human thing to want to access, you know, this, this, this common experience. And these copies of the, of the shroud, these copies of Jesus' face on cloth was one, were one way to do that. And so I, and it, it grew, out, grew out of the experience of the woman in Luke 8 who who touched Jesus' garment and was healed of her 12 years issue of blood. Any, any questions about Veronica? She's commemorated on July 12th. So if you know any of any Veronica's, that's their Saint's Day. There is a Saint Veronica. What's that? Tell me. My grandmother's name was Veronica Madeline Schmierer. They named Very good. their daughter, my mother, Veronica Madeline Evans. And our granddaughter is Veronica Louise Jones. So that's a popular name up the line there, Father Morris. Yes. They have there's, to, a, you know, yeah. there's a St. Veronica's Church down on Christopher Street, too. Is that right? Oh, I'll have to mm. take a look. Uh, uh, not an Orthodox church. Uh, uh, Roman Catholic. Roman, okay. And I can I, I will make, a, make a completely uh, irreverent, which is not unexpected, but I had, uh, I was at a conference one once, uh, women's studies conference, uh, Christian women, and the, there was a singer there and she said she had made it her mission in life to write songs celebrating the unnamed women in scripture and to give them names. So the hemorrhaging woman in Luke 8, she called Flo. And this one mm. in Luke 13, the bent over woman, she called Eileen. And I've never forgotten it. I mean, it's funny, but it's the, the number of unnamed uh, people. Right, and, 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 and also awesome. that's, a, that's a very human thing too, it's to want point, to identify point, these people. It's, it's, I find it very poignant that these people, the, and the Samaritan woman, uh, until you talked about what her name, uh, as people later understood it, that they, they're not named. Uh, they're just passed by. These things happen, but uh, they didn't matter enough to get the name. You know, which is and naming is so important in scripture in other parts. So anyway, but that's that was her her line about it. Right. I I would say just just if I may before we move on that the um the third class relics collection that that still that still happens that's not something from yeah. the ancient past that goes on that goes on now yeah. i have some okay but not to interrupt your flow father morris but what that sparked in me is a memory of it's the crown of thorns that one of the louis paid a lot of money for to put in the new the saint chapelle right is yes. That actually, an authentic relic, or does it have, or is it just oh, Louis the Ninth? It's it's still in the treasury of Notre Dame. Yeah, Louis yes. the Ninth. That's right. Saint that, Louis. That, right. We. Yes, that has a, a many of the first class relics in Western Europe have a very painful history 
insofar as that they, they are authentic as far as we can tell, but they were stolen from Constantinople by the Fourth Crusade. Constantinople had an incredible treasury of relics. And when the Fourth Crusaders sacked Constantinople in 1204, they sent most of the relics back home to Western Europe. And the great collection of, most of the great collection of relics in Western Europe are the result of the sack in 1204, the crown of thorns being part of one of those things that were sent back home that the, the French knights um, sent a lot of stuff back to Paris, including the crown of thorns. Louis brought it into the city himself in procession. And Saint-Chapelle is a reliquary. It's a beautiful church, yeah. Yeah, it, but it is a reliquary. It's just a large it's, reliquary. But it, it's so, Louis the Ninth, because my Countess Agnes outwits the much younger Louis the Ninth earlier than, uh, than in this time. She outwits him and holds on to her county. So uh, <laughs> if it's that Louis, then she wins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a the, the, the ownership of those relics is a very painful thing. Um, you know, it's like the museum artworks that, you know, yeah. are the result of not, a, not entirely up and up, you know, collectors. Um, <laughs> and and how, you know, at what point do things get given back? And, or it, do they ever? But the Crusaders, do they ever? The Fourth Crusaders were just foreclosing on the Venetians, the money that the Byzantines owed to Venice. So they were just foreclosing. No, no, on, that's. Uh, <laughs> we we will come back to that another time. In in Acts twenty one, in Acts twenty one verses uh, in verse nine, uh, we we are told that uh, we, presumably Paul and uh, Luke. Uh, came to Caesarea and went to the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven, one of the, one of the deacons, and stayed with him. He had four, uh, four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy. So th this is probably uh, around 58 AD, and the, the four daughters are identified as Miriamne and Hermione. The two, the two main ones are Miriamne and Hermione. Hermione was a, was a medical student, and she is said to have opened a clinic in Ephesus. And um, she uh, was a very accomplished uh, uh, doctor there. Uh, now, the whole question about prophet, you know, that these four daughters had the gift of prophecy, you know, and we don't know that they were, there's no record that they were martyred. So they were presumably fairly long lived and they may in fact have been the source for a lot of what Luke includes in Acts uh, since they stayed there and, and Luke had the chance to interview them and, and collect stories and, and find out what they knew and what their experience had been. Um, but the whole idea you know, of what is a prophet and, uh, it'd be, is a very interesting one. And because we also have uh, from about this same time, a handbook from uh, how to run a parish outside Antioch called the Didache. And it says, don't you welcome a prophet, but don't let the prophet stay for more than three days. If a prophet <laughs> stays for more than three days, he's no real prophet. Uh, so uh, a, a, a prophet is primarily a preacher and a teller of truth, uh, you know, a very astute observer of reality, of human behavior and consequence. Um, in, so, the, in some of the Jewish uh, sermons, they like to identify seven women prophets of the Old Testament, one of whom is Eve. And so the, the whole the, the business of a prophet is to understand the difference between good and evil. So that the, the, the Jewish sermons that say Eve was a prophet, you know, she understood the difference. You know, they, they really do not want to uh, downplay what she did. And say, you know, she didn't understand or, you know, try to make her out to be like kind of a, a slow, slow witted uh, person who didn't quite understand. You know, they, they really exalt her. Uh, you know, she knew exactly what she was doing and she understood the consequences, but she understood that it would also be a good thing eventually in the end. And that, and it was because she had such an astute grasp of reality that she was really the important one. And that's why the serpent came to her first rather than Adam. 
and that if um, and that she was really the important one. Uh, if, if the serpent could make her taste the fruit, then Adam was a piece of cake. Uh, so it was it, it was really it was her fall that was much more important in, in the cosmic scheme of things than um, Adam's fall. But there there are um, through, the, through the next two or three hundred years of church history. Uh, all other preachers and prophets are measured against the daughters of Philip. That they're in, in Eusebius, Eusebius uh, wrote this famous church history in the fourth century. And in chapter three, for instance, he, he lists these other prophets, who are, some of whom are as good as the daughters of Philip, and some of whom are nowhere near as trustworthy as the daughters of Philip. So they, they become the gold standard of, of what it is to be a prophet. In, in Christian circles. Now, the other thing that's very interesting about them is did they or did they not wear veils? Because in some of the epistles, it's very important that women uh, cover their heads. Uh, and in Jewish society, it was important for, for married women to cover their heads. There's no record that these daughters were ever married. Um, but Roman matrons and, and Jewish married women would, of course, cover their head. Uh, working women, poor women, uh, went, younger women would not. So it was also a class distinguisher. Um, it, concubines and courtesans were not allowed to, to veil their head. So if a man had a wife and then two or three concubines, the wife would veil her head, but the concubines and courtesans would not. And then St. Paul also makes this very strange remark about how um, the angels care about whether men and women have long hair or not, um, which is a little difficult for us at you know, this, this far or removed to, to quite wrap our heads around. But it seems that you know, long, beautiful hair on a woman was almost uh, a talisman, an amulet against evil. So if you were going to be a preacher or a prophet, if you were going to open yourself up to the invisible world, you wanted to have long, beautiful hair as a way to protect yourself from evil influence. And uh, short hair, dirty hair, matted hair was an invitation to, to evil to, to come in. To, and you know, it, was, it was an invitation for possession. So that uh, if the women prophets of, of the church almost always would have beautiful long hair without the veil, because if you veiled your hair, you, you, hit, you, you hit it and you lost the, the, am, you lost the amulet properties, you, you lost the protective properties. Uh, that would keep evil away from you. So that, I mean, so then that that play that that shows up in a lot of other stories. Lady Godiva, uh, Eve is sometimes shown with long silken dresses. Um, sometimes, you know, we say, "Oh, the artist just didn't want to show a naked body," which is maybe part of it. But the, but the idea that this long hair would protect you from evil unless you deliberately threw yourself at at it. That, that, that there's, there's that part of it. Um, and so um, gender, you know, the, the angels care about gender representation. And if you present yourself right, then the angels will protect you. If, you, if, you, if, you, if you're a man with short hair and a beard, the angels will protect you. If you're a woman with long, beautiful hair, the angels will protect you. It's when you play around with gender presentation that the angels will say, that, you know, that they're, they're not going to look out for you anymore. Mm -hmm. um, so another very interesting woman in Acts 17 is Damaris. She was present when Paul preached in Athens at the Areopagus, which was probably around AD 55. And of course, the, the first question is, why was a woman at the Areopagus? Why was she there to hear him? Um, we, we know from other records that the, Areop the Areopagus was, a, was the place where it, people collected, you know, they got together to, to talk over the news and to discuss philosophy. 
around the, the sides of the Areopagus, you would have a whole series of, of booths or kiosks and different philosophers would set themselves up um, with little schools, you know, that, that, that this with little booths and this philosopher would be here with his collection of students and this philosopher would be over there with his students and people could wander around and talk philosophy and, and, and take classes if they wanted to with different philosophers. Um, very, very high status prostitutes would also be involved in these philosophic discussions because one of the things very, very high class prostitutes were expected to do was to discuss philosophy with their clients, that uh, they, they were expected to be um, informed and, and educated. And, and you know, in, in the culture of Athens, high class women lived very sequestered lives. It was the, these really, these intellectual courtesans uh, were exempt from that. Um, they were able to stand on their own intellectually. They were expected to be able to have very uh, intellectual esoteric debates on philosophical uh, subjects. We're not told by the Bible that Damaris was one of these high-class courtesans, but the fact that she was present uh, when Paul preached at the Are on the Are Areopagus suggests that as a possibility. Um, she may have been a Stoic. The Stoics were notorious for wel welcoming women into their philosophical discussions, unlike some of the other um, groups. We're also told that one of the men who converted to uh, converted as a result of Paul's sermon on the, on the, in Athens on the Areopagus was named Dionysius. And maybe she was his wife, or she eventually, you know, she eventually might have married him. Because um, that sermon was, notor was notoriously not successful. Uh, St. Paul did not get a lot of converts as a result of that sermon, except, Denar except for Dionysius and Damaris. Um, Damaris was ev uh, evidently uh, martyred, and the new, uh, the new Testament scholar Richard uh, Bacham uh, writes that anytime we come across the name of someone in the book of Acts or in one of the apostles' letters, it's because there was, that person had become very widely known. You're not going to take up the space in writing the story down to, na to bother naming people unless, the, unless your readers would recognize that name and know who it was. So because we know Damaris's name, we know that she had to have been very well known in the ministry uh, of the churches connected with St. Paul. So that's a, you know any that's another thing like in, in Saint Mark's Gospel where he says you know Simon the Cyrenian the father of Alexander and Rufus helped carry the cross. Well, why would you bother saying who his sons were unless the people reading the gospel knew Alexander and Rufus? You know that that was a way to make a connection. That it was you know the guys in the next pew over you know the ones that always sit there every Sunday morning. It was their father who helped carry the cross. So anytime you, anytime any of these people are actually named in the New Testament, that that by itself tells you that these people were, were somebody. Um, there's Lydia in Acts 16. It says that she um, she lived in Western Turkey in Thyateria. She dealt in purple dye and and uh, and purple cloths. We talked about her a little bit last time. She was a very, very wealthy woman because um, it was a this 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 particular dye was a very was very exclusive, and um, and, and if you were involved, if you were if you dealt in this particular kind of purple dye, you you made a lot of money. Um, she we know she supported Paul and Silas and Timothy around Philippi. She was probably a widow because there's never any mention of her husband. But she seemed to run the business herself, and um, she funded uh, a lot of St. Paul's missionary work. There's Lois and Eunice. In, uh, we, they're mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 1. Um, you know, Timothy was, you know, Lois was the grandmother, and Eunice was the mother. Uh, or was it the other? Anyway, the, the, they were the mother and grandmother of Timothy. And they were, they were known for being very pious and very faithful. And uh, they taught him everything he knew. 
um, which underscores the, the importance of women and the transmission of the faith. You know, it's a, it's a it became a, a, how do I want to say, a stereotype during the communist period in Russia that the faith was preserved by the old women in the church. And they were the ones who kept, kept coming to church when it wasn't safe. They were the ones who kept, you know, kept the, uh, the church going when nobody else could. And the first time, for the second time, I was in Moscow in the mid nineties. Uh, I saw this happen. I was, at, uh, I was standing in the congregation of a church uh, one Saturday night and the Vesper service was going on around me. And a, and a woman who was probably, you know, youngish, late twenties, you know, maybe mid thirties came up to me and started and asked me, you know, something that was clearly a question in Russian. And I, and I, was, clear, I was obviously a priest and I had to say, I, I don't know Russian enough to understand what you're asking, I'm sorry. And the woman repeated it and I said, I just, I'm sorry, I just, I can't help you. And a, a, an old grandmother came up, to, came up to us and started talking to the, to the younger woman and then took the woman by the elbow and throughout the rest of the Vespers, I watched the, grand, the old lady took the young woman from icon to icon to icon and showed her how to cross herself, how to, how to bow, how to light a candle, and was you know, explaining who these saints were. And it was just you know, to, see, you know, to see right in front of you the transmission of the faith like that, that this is how the, the church survived for more than 70 years and would continue to survive you know, going forward that the, the passing on of, of the stories and of the, the tradition from one generation uh, to the next was just um, stunning to see. And, and we don't always appreciate the importance of, of, of that, I, I, don't, I don't think. Um, you know, if the, it's the people get, oh, you know, so-and-so wants to be active. Uh, we need a Sunday school teacher. Sort of shunt them off into teaching Sunday school. Uh, and it's so important. It's so important, and we we don't always give it the the, the recognition that it deserves. Perhaps because they were busy passing it down orally, that it never got written. Yes, that's very true. I mean, yeah, in the early days, of course, the, the literacy was a, was a different issue. Um, also in Philippi, we have these famous women, you, uh, I, can, I can never pronounce this first one right, Evodia, the way you pronounce it depends on what kind of Greek you speak. Evodia and Syntyche, uh, they were, they, in Acts 16, they were, um, there other, there's another woman, Evodia uh, with Lydia, maybe it's the same one, it's hard to know. Um, but evidently, these two women were like the pillars of the church in Philippi, and they had some big fight that they were, they, you could just see, you know, they were probably on standing on two opposite sides of the church, and they were like ready to kill each other. Um, in Philippi chapter four, it says that whatever, this, whatever their fight was, was ready to tear the parish apart. And I think we've all known places like that. Uh, <laughs> The you know so we don't know what the fight was about, but they they were clearly the two most important people in the, in the parish, and they were going to the whole thing was going to unravel because of them. We know that they were very wealthy. They were co-workers, co-strugglers uh, with Paul, so they also funded a lot of his work. They funded the the church in Philippi. Um, the, the fact that he calls them co-strugglers or co-contenders, you know, he uses this athletic reference. Um, it suggests possibly martyrdom. Because very often the martyrs were described in these in these um, athletic metaphors. Um, we don't know for sure. Maybe one of them was was Jewish and one was Greek, and so there, it plays out this this Jewish Greek uh, tension that was so common in other parishes across the Mediterranean world. They may one of them one of the women may have had Gnostic tendencies and the other woman not. So that we and that we also see play out in many other. Uh, situations in the New Testament. Um, you know, one, maybe one ate meat and one only ate vegetables. You know, there's all, kinds of all kinds of fights that we know about in the New Testament 
that could easily explain what these two women disagreed about so uh, so so uh, vociferously. And Paul begged them to be reconciled with each other, uh, but he did not get involved. He appointed some ar he appointed an anonymous arbitrator to sort of sort it out. Paul clearly did not want to alienate either one of them. <laughs> so that, that also says something about how important they were to his ongoing missionary work, that he was not going to risk uh, scaring one of them off or getting one of them mad at him. He did not want them to get mad at him. He wanted them, if they were going to get mad, they should be mad at each other and they should really be reconciled. That would be the best thing. Um, so this, this demonstrates, one, how important female leadership was in these early communities. And it also demonstrates how important the kiss of peace was at the Eucharist, that you could not, that it was, you could not participate in receiving communion if you did not participate in the kiss of peace. And how could you authentically participate in the kiss of peace if you were ready to cut each other's throats, if you were had that kind of uh, yeah. dispute, you know, so, uh, so Paul urging them to be reconciled. Also, there was, an, there was a liturgical aspect to this reconciliation that Paul was, was, was urging them to embrace. Um, that again, you know, the Phil Philippians, the, uh, the letter to, uh, was written in the mid 50s to the early 60s, uh, which is about the same time as, uh, as I said, that this church handbook, the Didache was written in Antioch. Uh, which, which is the handbook for how to how to run a parish, and the the, the kiss of peace is so important uh, in the Didache, and so we know it was important throughout the Mediterranean world in the in the parish churches. So whenever Paul talks about the holy kiss, it's not just uh, it's not just a metaphor; it's a real thing that he's talking about the liturgical kiss of peace at the Eucharist, and. And that you could ex it, you could expect people who were having real fights, uh, if they if they shared the kiss of peace at the Eucharist, then it was real. That you you, you couldn't just uh, skate by, by you know, by pretending a quick peck on the cheek and say yeah, you know that was it. Um, any questions or comments about any of these people so far? I just think it's probably worth mentioning that the Didache is the oldest extant liturgical material we have. And what's interesting about it is that when we read the Didache, how much of our current liturgical practice we can see there, it's really quite remarkable. It is. It's amazing. Yes, Gwendolyn. Yeah, uh, you know, there is a St. Lydia Dinner Church in Brooklyn, and yeah. I knew someone years ago at uh, St. Bart's or Trinity that would take her son to it, and basically you just call up to so they know how many people are going, and they, they sort of try to do this kind of house church sort of thing. I'm not sure if that's the only one or if it's a movement but they have a website and it's just interesting to know about it. I've never gone because Inwood is like a million miles away from Brooklyn. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's just interesting that, that some people are trying to start up different kinds of things that are not necessarily in competition with the church because they're being held at, at sort of outside times. Right, and the fact that they would connect themselves to her and 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 use her name as as kind of their patroness, um, yes, is interesting because yeah. she she would not have cooked dinner, uh -huh. you know, herself. She <laughs> she had cooks and waiters and butlers and maids. She did not do any of that kind of stuff herself. Well, I think what they do is they have different people do the cooking and, and I think people bring stuff and it's a whole thing that it starts from preparing the meal to having the meal and then I think they, they do some reading or discussion or something afterwards. Yeah, yeah. one of the interesting things about the, like the house churches that St. Paul talks about is that, that the layout of a typical Roman house plays into the factions that he complains about in Corinth because a typical Roman house was big, but it wasn't that big. And so you would have the main dining room 
but then the, the parish would inevitably spill out. You know, you could fit maybe maybe 30 people if you were really cozy in, the, in, a, in a Roman dining room. But then other people would have to be in other rooms around the dining room. And so they could, they could hear, but they couldn't see necessarily. And the food would get to those other rooms late, mm. you know, after the main dining room had been served. So when he's so when St. Paul is talking about you, you know, some people eat and the other people are still hungry, and some people are drunk and the other people don't have enough. Part of it is is the layout of a Roman the, the, the house church, hmm. and and how thing how f just f stuff would get distributed, you know, and it, it takes time. I remember being at one church banquet that didn't have enough waiters, and my you know. The people up front were done with dinner before the people in the back had even gotten the appetizers yet. And it's, you know, people were pulling their hair out and, and going crazy. But they um, did, of course, one of the, the signs that a local, high, uh, a local house church was succeeding is they would remove those walls, those interior walls that were not weight bearing. Yes, if they didn't and, have one. Until yeah. eventually the family would just move out and the <laughs> community would take over the house once yes. they started removing the walls. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then also you'd have to, you know, one of those rooms, uh, especially, especially after the family moved out, the bathroom would become the baptistry because yes. that was the place where you had the water mm. to, to, to immerse people in uh, for baptism. Um, so... So a lot of the, it's, it's a lot of the, if you read between the lines in the New Testament, a lot of stuff you can trace back to just the layout of a, of a Roman house. Mm -hmm. It was one woman you didn't mention from uh, the, uh, from, from Acts, the, uh, the slave girl in Ephesus, I think, who had the gift of prophecy. Right, right. Does she count as a prophet, I wonder. Well, she evidently did because she told the truth, you know, much to, uh, she told the truth so much she was a pain in the neck and and Paul turned around and said shut up go away stop bothering me and she she did you know her hair did not protect her uh, the angels left you know abandoned her and she lost this the, the gift of prophecy and then Paul got in trouble because the men who made money off of it got upset and, and, and took him to court um, so yeah truth telling was never the the, the church did not have monopoly on telling the truth. That there were there were prophets, out you know, and truth tellers outside of the church, and that these the the the, the, the Greek philosophers were considered by a lot of the early apologists, the early Christian writers, treated the, uh, the Greek philosophers this as the equivalent of the Hebrew prophets. That they were the ones who got the their people ready in a language that they spoke in a way that they would understand. And so the, you know, this woman, the slave girl in, in Acts was, is an example of one of these truth tellers outside of the official legitimate, uh, uh, with, you know, that with no official legitimate connections, but that nevertheless told the truth and got people ready for the message of the gospel when it came. Interesting. Uh, Jesus has that. Uh, they come, uh, the the um, disciples come up to him and said, "There's someone uh, uh, preaching in your name who uh, who isn't part of the club. Tell him to stop." And Jesus said, "No. Whoever is not against me is with me." Right. right. Yeah, and then there are other places where he's you know where they, they took the opposite tack. So you know context you know depends on a little bit. Um, I don't know if. The, the first, who was the first Stoic? I, I forget his name. The, but the guy that went around in the, in the barrel looking for an on, Yeah, Di, I'm not sure if the apostles would, would welcome Diogenes into their company because he was probably a very unpleasant person to, to hang around with. But his, his followers, they certainly would, would welcome as, as the equivalent of the prophets, you know, that they, they began to get the people ready for the gospel for when it came. And Plato. You know, he he, uh, he 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 was to the Greeks what the prophets were to the Hebrews. Augustine and a lot of the early preachers, Justin Martyr, 
uh, a lot of the early apologists uh, said that, you know, they, they, it was worth it was worth studying these people for that very reason. Whereas other people said you should never read any of those Greek or Roman philosophers; they're totally worthless. Yeah. Well, that was um, the, whole, the whole revolution in the you know in in the UK and in France when the scholasticism really really took off. It was it was it was fueled by Plato and Aristotle. Yeah, yeah. And so it's yeah. The re, so the rediscovery of these other truth tellers. Mm. So there's just a couple minutes left. I don't think there's time to get started on some, on some of the other mer bearers. Uh, let me see if I have any any real quick people, unless you all have a, have another question. Or you you did my girlfriend Priscilla Priscilla last week, uh, Father Moore. Priscilla. Oh, I could, we talked about her a little, but Priscilla gets mentioned in Acts and Romans and First Corinthians and Second Timothy. She is all over the place. Evidently, she, and she's always gets named first, Priscilla and Aquila. It's all, it's never Aquila and Priscilla. She's always the one to come. So she had to be the main, she was the important one. She was the one people paid attention to. And um, they were Jewish. They were part of the, the, the synagogue in Rome and uh, they became Christians. And so they were, they led, they were part of the Messianic Jewish contingent in the, in the, the Jewish community. But in, um, What's the year? 41 or 49 uh, AD, uh, the Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews from Rome. And so Priscilla and Aquila had to leave. It was like uh, the end of Fiddler on the Roof. Everybody had to leave Anatevka. All the Jews had to leave Rome. And Priscilla and Aquila ended up in Corinth and they met St. Paul there. And Aquila was a tent maker. And so he would sit around and make tents all day with Paul to, to earn, you know, to, to support them. And uh, Priscilla uh, taught, and she evidently taught Apollos. Um, yeah. the, the epistle to the Hebrews, some people tried to say Apollos wrote, everybody said Paul did not write it. Some people said Apollos wrote it, but everybody agreed that anything Apollos knew, he learned from Priscilla, and that Priscilla was really probably the one who wrote Hebrews. Um, and Priscilla and Aquila were martyred as a couple, uh, alas, uh, later on. But uh, she had a very, she is, her thumbprint is so important uh, in, in Christian history and in Christian theology that uh, the epistle to the Hebrews you know, is the, the Didache is the first, you know, how, how to do a service. And the epistle to the Hebrews is one of the first commentaries on what does it mean to do the Eucharist? And so, so she, she had a, a, a formative you know, effect on shaping how Christians think about the Eucharist and the, the sacrifice it's, of Christ. It's, it, those, those, it's like a series of sermons and she sweeps to a conclusion like Martin Luther King would sweep to a conclusion, you know? The only thing that's missing is mine eyes have seen the glory. It's, it's a, you know, there's just a flow to it. Yeah, some, 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 sometime I have a year, year or two, year or two worth of talks about the Epistle to the Hebrews that we could uh, go into. But she, she, you know, she was, she shaped Christian thinking in so many important ways. The, 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 I can't find the reference right now of where it is, but the, the, the line I remember about her is that, that she, they, the, the, she, or I think it says they, they explained, uh, the way to to them to the other followers of Jesus more thoroughly. In other words, the others had, some of the other teachers hadn't done it very well, but Priscilla right. and Aquila explained the way. Uh, right, well, they, they were the sophisticated ones. They they came to, to they came they were they were from Rome, and they and they ended up in Corinth. And all these hicks in Corinth got the real sophisticated you know, the real stuff from Rome right. and. Um, <laughs> I have a question. Who who would have killed them if they were already thrown out? If they were already expelled from Rome, who um, caused them well, the, to kill the them? Rome the Romans um, were you know they threw the Jews out of Rome, but then they they decided the Christians had to be exterminated. So it was because they were known to be Christians that they were by the Romans. By the Romans. By the Romans. Okay, uh, I don't know. We're getting some. We're we're getting some kind of recording. Somebody's watching the news. Yeah, but we've also reached our time. 
So yes. we'll have to we'll have to stop this very interesting discussion and pick it up next week at five o'clock. And we learn we look forward to hearing more about the the people you will introduce us to next time or or help us understand better. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Bye bye.